it's a sort of neglected space um, on the north bank of the river at a point where when you're walking along the river you have to leave the river and go up to Upper Thames Street and it's a sort of backwater and it's not um, very noticeable and yet it is the very place where medieval London grew out of. It's the spot um, where King Alfred decided to re-establish uh, London as a major city. And, you know, it's got a, an incredible history. I'm not sure where the original idea, I think it may have come from the city, um, to, on, on their, on their um, environmental area, uh, where I was advised that in other parts of the city, uh, not many, but one or two, there are in fact mosaics which work very, very well. So I, then my mind started working along that. So I met David Tootle from South Bank Mosaics. Uh, we had a very, really constructive meeting. It looked like it might work, it might be a starter. And since then, we've continued our discussions um, and there's been a, a dialogue around how we would do it, the methodology, a dialogue around um, the experts that we involve. David asked me to come in and help with the drawing work. Uh, my colleague Jo, who works at South Bank, she had had the original concept for the design, um, which was to have the river running through the middle and then the story, um, the timeline running along the top. So my first task was to produce um, this, which uh, only at tiny scale had to fit in 2,000 years of history all along the route of the River Thames. Uh, and it was such a lovely idea to combine, you know, the geography with the time. It was just irresistible, but it was such hard work, I couldn't believe it. 2,000 years is a lot of history. And when we started, we didn't really know anything about the local history. Um, in terms of history, um, we've previously worked with John Newman. So we approached him to help us with the research and the history of Queen Hyde Dog. For the Queen Hyde Project, I basically do two things. Uh, the first thing is that I, I support the research volunteers uh, in order to do the background research that informs the, the images that get put on the mosaic, you know, just what, what, is, what is the content, what is, what is the history, we need to know that first of all before, uh, before we start illustrating that history on the mosaic. So it was important to get, to get the history correct. Um, and part of the challenge was to make it visual, you know, the researchers found out all these interesting facts, but some of them were, quite frankly, rather hard to illustrate. I worked with about 10, 12 volunteers who were all interested in different bits of the history, whether it was the kind of kings and queens or, or the wildlife of the area or uh, what got traded at the market, things like that. Um, and we had all the creatures that lived in the Thames and some of the as historical figures associated with Queen Hive, but also an awful lot of kings and kind of rather random people who were just things that happened in English history. So, for example, one of the things that I did was to organise uh, a couple of sessions for the volunteers at the Guildhall Library in the City of London. And I had to find objects that were related to London in some way, preferably the Thames, things that have been found in the Thames, that had little decorative things that we could use in, in the design. Um, and, and sort of try and piece it all together, so. This is a big project, and we also need more knowledge and skills. So we um, wanted an archaeologist because we want to use tile collected from the river. And I approached uh, Mike Weber, who is an expert on the River Thames and knows this area and knows Queen Hythe really well. 
So I've been working with two groups, in fact. A group of volunteers um, from South Bank Mosaics. And we also invited the City of London Boys School uh, to get involved as well. We would do a walk, a historical walk, created by myself one week, and then we would go on what we call the foreshore walk. And we would walk right along across to Queen Hythe Dock. So we walked past it and we walked within it and enjoyed ourselves exploring it. And then we would walk on through towards the Millennium Bridge and all the way finding interesting artefacts that have been deposited by our forefathers, if you like, and uh, the people who lived in the City of London for many, many hundreds of years. The volunteers I've worked with on this project um, were totally baffled when we first came down to the beach. Most of them had never been here, um, and certainly none of them had the slightest idea what they were looking for. But on the second visit, they started to pick up the Victorian, the brightly coloured stuff. And then we said, right, no more of that. We've now got to look for the duller colours, the dull yellows, oranges of the Tudor period, all hand painted this time, not transfer printed. And sure enough, we came up with that. Um, and then eventually we got way back to the Roman period. And I have to say, when I very first came across Queen Hive, uh, the hair on my, the back of my neck stood up. I almost felt that it was a really, it was a real uh, moment for me because it is in fact the only Anglo-Saxon dock surviving, well, within the whole world, obviously being Anglo-Saxon, it's set in Europe, but that alone made me feel all the multi-layers of life, the loves, the lives, the, the deaths, the births, the, the rich, the, 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 the making of wealth, the, the losing of wealth, I, you know, in that one spot, we have really no idea of just how much um, went on in that spot. And I think that's what I felt. I felt really much an affinity with that place. And that's what made me very excited to discover that it was going to be commemorated in, in this way with a 30 meter long mosaic, um, basically charting the history of that spot in the city. I have to say it's very, very exciting. Well, I think it reinforced what I always felt, that it's a really interesting place. Um, and that it's got so many layers of history and connection. And, and I like the fact that it's got these really ultra modern buildings next to these really ancient places. And, and that you, wherever you go, there's always something new in London. You know, I didn't know about Queen Hive, and it's, it's amazing, the only Anglo-Saxon dock left in the world, and I didn't know about it. So, and I think I know about London history. So you can never, ever get to know London, and I think that's why it attracts people, because it's just so, just so much in it. Um, but we gathered all of the material. Then, of course, it has to be washed. So all of our finds taken back um, to South Bank Mosaics and washed just using water and scrubbing brushes. Um, and then, of course, it's all laid out to dry. And it's at that point that you realise just how much you've collected. And also, you start to spot the huge differences in the techniques, the colours, the patterns, and so on. So once we'd washed, dried, we then had to sort the pottery. And rather than doing this by myself, um, the volunteers were actually quite eager to get involved in that. The one thing I love most about this mosaic is that for the first time, the importance of this place is going to be recognised. And a very special site it is, the birthplace of modern London. Yeah, I mean, at this stage, we've got two key artists who are doing the drawing onto the craft paper and the making in terms of a sort of template of how a particular part of the mosaic will look. So that uh, Joe Thorpe uh, is doing most of... Uh, the design idea of the use of colour and which materials and which tiles we'll use in a particular part of the mosaic. And Maria Palmieri is doing a lot of the actual drawing up 
of the design onto the craft paper. So my role is on one side to work uh, on the planning and the design of the work with Jo and um, Tessa, and then uh, to teach and guide our volunteers uh, who work on the mosaic making um, stage. At the moment, for example, I'm working on scaling up the drawings that Tessa has provided. So obviously that requires a bit of adjustment according to the space that you got and thinking about the material you're going to use and the size of tiles you're going to use to make it easier for people to work it without obviously compromising the quality of the work. I'm very interested in making mosaics well because that's a, you know, it's a really useful artistic skill and that, you know, I really enjoying that side of it as well, not just the archaeology, but the actual seeing how people make these amazing mosaics and I'd like to carry on with both strands really. So we are in June now and all um, the design has been drawn up um, to real scale and we are in the middle of the making process now. Um, we are working into like separate sections um, so we would have things like patterns, scenes, coins, animals, um, lettering, telling things about um, what we found out during the research, so the history of London linked to Queen Eight Dock. Um, and each panel is set according to specific rules. Um, we prepare a chart that shows people how to make the letters. So that guides them uh, in deciding which line is the most important, how to cut the tiles, what sort of sides we are looking at, these sort of things. And then it's a great help when many people uh, work on the same project. And same thing with animals. So we set colors, we set the andamento, and people are guided through it. Um, in terms of colour, we prepared, Jotorp actually prepared um, a palette. So this is the whole um, design. It's not completed yet, the last, the last bit missing. But it basically sets the main colours for each section. So whenever I set up a new section, I know what my main colour is. And then I just pick up two or three to make it more interesting, um, create a bit of lights point, things like that. But that is a great uh, help for me. At this stage, I'm just setting up different panels for people to work on. So we have a code for each color, so we would have boxes like that that shows the color code and there is some pre-cut tiles for people to use. And we start doing also um, a folder where we put all the instruction and there is each section with reference images that I use when I set up um, the section. And there are also a bit more detailed instruction for the people to follow, but obviously I'm always here helping them, so it's just more for myself than the volunteers. But it's been, you know, it's going very well. Um, we are starting working a bit faster now because you know, the, all the preparation has been done, really, and uh, it's just a matter of doing it now and training new people and try to get as many people involved as possible. Uh, so we now have a team of volunteers who come twice a week, and little by little our aim is to work on the project every day and have a certain number of people who are dedicated to this and make sure to meet to meet the deadline end of August. The installation is supposed to be in September. So there's lots of work to do, there is lots of excitement, people are getting really you know, enthusiastic about it. And yes, it's um, quite demanding, uh, but it's been a great experience so far. And I think in probably about um, six weeks, we'll assess how far we've got um, you know, are we on schedule? Do we need to have more of an input? Uh, do we need to try and recruit more volunteers? But I think as we're going at the moment, we're on schedule and we've got uh, uh, good groups of people emerging. So we're finally preparing the mosaic for the installation. Um, it's 
quite exciting, although a bit scary. Um, the idea is to lay out the mosaic on the floor in different sections um, to check how well the section fits together and lay the mosaic on paper together with the edging uh, made with the found objects from the river. And we're going to take the final measurements to make sure they are right and check for uh, any adjustment to be made in terms of colour, in terms of you know, size of the sections and yeah, hopefully it's not one too many. How are we doing? We're a bit baffled. <laughs> do we need a um, do we need a map? Is, have we got a map that tells us what I think that's what we yeah. How are you so, here? At this point, you, are you, no, this is okay. That's okay. Yeah. So it might it might turn out okay then. <laughs> mm. Oh, the precision of this task. I think we were better off with the bottom working. That's yeah, just it to to it. And then uh, the bottom and the river were working okay, and then there was just a bit of a problem with Shakespeare. Okay, so let's, shall we move back to the river? I'm going to move everything up and These are my little notes for the installation. Um, it's not a proper installation plan, but it kind of tells me what, what sort of, you know, what sections goes where. And at the moment, I'm just writing down the section for the river bits, just to make sure that they are in the right place compared to the section of the mosaic. And then, because we're going to put the section away, we're going to put them into boxes, and they're going to have to be put in a certain order to make it easier on the daily installation just to pick up the right piece. Fraboski! Fraboski! Fully giovane! Very good. Impressive Italian culture. Well, welcome here to South Bank was 8, and uh, here we are in the process of uh, um, constructing the, uh, the mosaics on the, on the sea wall where we are here at the moment on the Queen Pipe um, Mosaic project. Anyway, we have to prepare the wall with a band of marble at the top and at the bottom. And in between, uh, we've got uh, the bands of bits and pieces that were found in the river. Uh, the mosaic then gets put up in between. We put it up with a, um, a special adhesive and fix the mosaics, uh, which gives them a solid bed, which makes them uh, very good in, a, in all weathers. This is the procedure. We've actually put the mosaic, uh, the uh, adhesive up already, and now we're actually going to pre grout the mosaic, which I'm going to do now and show you how we actually fix it. I push it into the joints gently. You do then, you slap it on very close to where it's supposed to go. So it sticks very quickly, and you can't keep it in your hand too long because, uh, because it the paper dissolves very quickly and uh, it would break up in your hand so you haven't got long to actually take it, grab it and then put it, put it on the wall. And then you beat it into place as you see and you line every line in as you can see uh, which the artists have pre-done for me uh, uh, when they've actually made the mosaics up. Now I must make sure I push all the air bubbles out because air bubbles could destroy a job. And when you've actually done that, you wet the mosaic. Once it's actually set a little bit, you then with a trail, 
you actually start beating it like so. So you get it, so you get all the air bubbled out. There's an air bubble there, so you have to actually pierce the paper to get it out. And once you've done that, you know that the mosaic is fully bedded onto the wall. When the actual paper has actually dissolved after 25, 30 minutes, and you start taking the paper off, it will just peel off. And once it starts peeling off like that, the idea then is that you beat it, you beat one joint into the other, so you don't see the joints. You grab the top, like this. Got that on there, it dissolves the glue on top of the paper. And once the glue is dissolved, after a few minutes, you then wash it off. Then you give it another beat. And once you've done that, you give it a second wash. And then the day after that, you can give it a wash down with a, 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 a very um, slight acid wash and that will clean it up perfect. Basically, the mosaic on paper came a little bit shorter um, to the edge. So because it's just one strip, literally the space of a quarter, I'm just going to just fill in straight to the wall uh, with the right colours, hopefully. <laughs> and it should be all right. You know, when you do these big jobs, it's quite difficult to get it right. And then we did some adjustment because of the wall. It wasn't completely straight. So we did cut the mosaic a bit shorter on paper, maybe we went too short, but it's an easy fix, luckily. It's just on the edge, so I'm just going to build the line missing with quarters. The hardest thing is putting up... <laughs> I was going to say putting up a you lot. <laughs> no, um, the hardest thing here is, uh, is uh, these cobblestones. Walking on them, working on them, that's the hardest bit. The most rewarding uh, part of this job obviously is when I see it completely finished and it's all done. And obviously like, people who are walking past all love it, so that tells you something. <laughs> no, I mean this is one of the reasons why it's going to be so exciting to see the finished thing, because I've never worked like this before, I don't think anybody has. So David's original idea, I did the... Um, and Joe came up with a little concept of how the, the, the general plan would be. I did all the drawing and, and working out the details. Joe then worked out the colour scheme. Maria scaled it all up. And then the volunteers have actually done the making. So nobody really is individually responsible for it. It's a complete kind of team effort. And it would be very interesting. So here we are. We're in Queen High, very shortly to have its own mosaic which will be a legacy which may last up to a thousand years, but certainly 500, um, and a legacy that which we can all be incredibly proud of. And I've also enjoyed the mosaic side of it as well, making the mosaic and seeing how complex it is at a high level to make it, and it's very skillful and quite mathematical. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been very, very enlightening project. And I'd definitely like to carry on with the mosaic making and with um, finding out more about archaeology. And it's also interesting that how many people don't know of the existence of Queen Hive. So of course this project was absolutely fantastic for me to once again to bring that very interesting doc to the forefront to actually make people pay, uh, pay attention, take notice. And as, as I've said, you know, many, many times the mosaic is absolutely the perfect way to do that, to enlighten people about the history of that particular area.
our greatest mosaic fixer in the country at the moment. So, um, yeah, it's really privileged to have him with us and uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, a few questions. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, I mean, basically we'll get into a conversation, hopefully. So, um, what, first question, what were your passions as a young man? Oh. <laughs> well, I wanted to be a footballer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and uh, uh, did you play a lot of football? Oh, or? yes, I played it all my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and uh, what are your connections to Italy, and well, what advantages do you think this has given you? Well, both my parents are Italian, and uh, they come from Friuli. And my father was a mason, stonemason, and doing marble, terrazzo, and mosaics. And he had his own mosaic crew um, in, in, the, uh, in the 60s and uh, 70s. And uh, when I'd done my apprentice, I went with him after I'd done my apprentice and, uh, and started uh, doing mosaics with his crew uh, on a commercial base. Uh, and then after a couple of years, I was with his crew. His crew was getting old, I was young. I was eager to earn money and uh, I ended up going uh, on my own uh, with a little crew of myself and, uh, and started doing mosaics in a, in, a, in a more sort of like money making way. In our days, you got, uh, in my days, um, when, I, when I used to do mosaic, uh, we used to, um, there used to be jobs between 200 and 5,000 metres. You know, mm. massive scale, not like today, you know, where you're getting little, little, little uh, women making pictures and things like that. It was on a massive scale then, and therefore um, that's why I really got good at what I did at the time. Yeah, and um, did your father pick up um, his stonemason skills in it? Oh, yes. Yeah, and then he brought them he brought over them here. here. Yes. Okay, and, and do you know what made him come over here? Ah, uh, well, after the war, there was no work in Italy, so everybody was poor up in our region. So um, they had to. They, well, they went to. He first of all went to Belgium uh, as a coal miner because his sister, because there's no work anywhere, like, and uh, and after uh, and that's where we met my mum, who was also uh, there because there was no work in Italy. And they met a, an Italian gathering, as they did in them days. And, uh, and of course, they were from the same region, up in Friuli, and uh, taught the same language, got married. I was born there, and was only there for about a month, and then we went back to Italy. And then we came back to England for about six months, uh, when I was about a year and a half, because um, there was a lot of work going on here. But then he went back to Italy after for about uh, three years, and then we came back in 1956. And... Uh, Hmm. and stayed here since. Okay, and um, <clears throat> so what brought you into, I mean, obviously your fa it's your father's business, and, and were you really interested in it? Did it catch your hmm. imagination, or was it just something you... Well, no, my mum didn't want me to be um, uh, in, in the same game. She, uh, she turned around, she wanted me, an be, me to be an architect, but because I was very sporty, and so I always wanted to you know, do things all the time, and, um, hmm. It, architect wasn't really something I was really interested in, so I started. I was a chippy first of all. I started to chippy for about three months, and I got bored with it really, basically. Like, and then my father said, "Well, come with us." And uh, uh, so I started an apprenticeship at the Alpha Mosaic and Trazzo Company, um, mm. and uh, and from there, and then I went on from there. I did four years there and uh, went on. Okay, so you you did an apprenticeship at this. Uh, company and then you joined your father's business. That's right. Yeah. Well, we joined the father's crew, yeah. uh, which was because he had a crew. There was a, there was uh, quite a few crews about then. There was a like, but my father had about 20, 20 in his crew, and um, and he was in charge of one part of the mosaic business where there was terrazzo areas as well, like uh, parts of the business. And what were his main influences on you? Uh, uh, well. I was, well, his influences on me were um, basically like he, he actually uh, encouraged me to go with him when I was younger. And uh, so my weekends, if I wasn't playing football on a Saturday, I'd be Saturday morning that everybody seemed to work in them days. 
and, uh, and I ended up being on the jobs with, with him and his crew, mm. pasting up the sheets so they could stick them on the wall. Right. <laughs> that, that used to be my job, and clearing up. Yeah. So you had the sort of rough end of the stick at oh, first? Oh, very much so, yeah. OK, and you learned all the Well, in our days, you just get a kick up the arse, you know, when yeah. you were so... <laughs> if you didn't do as you say, you can't do that today, I'm afraid, but... <laughs> Um, what would you say are the key skills and attributes of a mosaic fixer? Um, practice. Practice and practice. It's the only way you're going to get good at it. You know, without practicing, you will never ever get good at fixing mosaics. It's, an art, it's, a, it's a skill that you can't teach people unless they're working with you every day. But there's not enough of it today like there was years ago. Years ago, while we was on a job, but for a whole job, maybe with the 5,000 metres on it, for a whole year and a half. So you're doing it every day. Um, and that's how you teach um, youngsters like myself, how I was taught, you know, but it's, them skills are gone now. Very hard to find them skills now. Um, do you think Mosaic has a good future, or, or would you say it's glory days um, or past? Uh, Commercial-wise, on big, big scales like outside buildings, that's gone now. You can't, we can't get that more. You are, um, due to a lot of failures over the years, um, due to uh, um, cradles whacking them and, you know, and they're coming down from a big height, these mosaics, you know. They're, they're now putting metal outside buildings instead of uh, mosaics like they used to. And the whole thing's changed. Out. But picture form, right? Like, everybody seems to want pictures done now, you know, like uh, murals and things like that. And uh, they're very, but like, it, it, it's an expensive trade. It's not cheap. Yeah, I mean, I, I wonder if the architects, maybe you have to go into architecture now, if the architects put an indent in, whether the cradles, the cradles are the, the, the window cleaners mostly. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, and they're whacking the, the tiles when they're on the outside. But if they were sort of embedded in some way, maybe it's an architectural issue, I don't know. No, it's just a, it's just an issue that happened. I mean, when you get these cradles that, that used to go up and down in years ago, like right? I mean, the wind used to catch them right and would bang straight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it was, it was once the wind caught them cradles. Um, it's, it's all different today, like right? I mean, it's all they're all more differently done, like you know. But uh, all the outside of buildings, I mean, not like not like we used to have nowadays. But then they had to, they had to cover the concrete up with something years ago, and that's why we had mosaics, so many under underpasses, the subways. Yeah. Um, how many projects do you estimate that you've worked on over Ooh. these last, what, 40, 50 years? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Christ. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> it wasn't 60 years, sorry. Six, six, last, oh, yeah, 50, 50 years. 50 years. Uh, oh, I don't know. Fa oh, thousands. Thousands of I mean, there's even ones down this street. That's right, there? yeah. I've worked in Stanford Street just down the road here when the uh, King's Reach building first went up. Um, loads of buildings. Uh, the, there was another one, um, I could, uh, the Metropolitan Hotel, um, and Edgware Road. Um, but there was loads and loads, you know, loads of projects. I mean, I've done a lot of mosaic work, like picture forms and stuff like that, for many artists, you know, over the years. Anna Weiner, I don't know if anybody remembers her. And, uh, and, and all the other mosaic artists that I do a lot for now. Mm. Um, and, and what would you describe as your greatest achievement? Uh, finishing a job. <laughs> <laughs> Every job That's I good. finish. <laughs> That's a good, good response. Um, how, how can we transfer the, the, the skills that you've got to the next generation. I mean, we've filmed them there because we're, we're worried, actually, about that aspect of it because yeah. we know that you've got these great skills, but how do we get the next generation to... Uh, take more, have another film done on me. <laughs> 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 and I could do it more in detail. Yeah, because uh, well, that uh, is a, uh, it's an yeah. idea, actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 because uh, the problem is, like, I can't teach my skills to anybody because they're... I, they could, because they're not there long enough. We're not doing enough of it. That's the mm. problem. It, they have to, like I said, they have to be with me every day mm. um, to actually learn how to... It's, it's playing with the stuff as well. You've got to realise that when you're actually um, fixing the sakes, in the, in, you can't fix below 10 degrees. So when you're outside, 10 degrees is the maximum you can go down to because the water's too cold. Um, 
it's, it gets to a point where you wouldn't wash your car if it was uh, outside with a sponge, would you? If it was under 10 degrees. And you can't really work over 28 degrees because over 28 degrees, the actual material goes off too quick. You know, so you don't get time on it. So you cut, you're, 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 made, you're doing less and less work. The best, the best temperature is around, around about 16 degrees because it keeps the, keeps the, the, the material moist and uh, you can work on it and you've got all day to play with it. You know, that's, that's, that's how you, but teaching someone, weather, the weather has got an aspect as well. If you're outside doing uh, mosaics, You've really got to watch the weather as well. I mean, if it's raining, forget about it, because you'll make more mess than what it's worth, you know. OK, have we got any questions that anybody would like to ask? Yeah, Jane. Unsurprisingly, I've got this one. Um, need an apprentice. <laughs> Sorry? Are you looking for an apprentice? Do you need an apprentice? No, I'm, no, I'm finished now. <laughs> oh. uh, see, no, I've retired now, so I'm okay. finished. Yeah. So, you know there was a discussion about transfer of knowledge because you can obviously guess I'm quite keen on that as well as lots of other people. What's the possibility of doing some sort of more involved detail? Like that, that information you just gave just then, for example, is brilliant. You know that mm -hmm. kind of tips would be really helpful. What's the possibility of doing like a more detailed video or maybe even producing? Something? Well, I could do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's no problem. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that that is I something that we would definitely be interested yeah. in working on. I'd be happy to take that on. As and then you could take it to a college or, you know, and do it that way or, or with, you know, because uh, it's, it's awkward sometimes, like, it's awkward to have someone with me, yeah. you know, like, because I can't really, we haven't got enough mosaics to do. Yeah. yeah. So you're still doing some work, you're not doing any at all now? No, no, I still do work, yeah, still do working very, but locally, because I can't drive at the moment because I've got a hip replacement, so uh, that's my problem there, yeah. <laughs> getting old. I've got a car. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't mind coming along and shadowing you for a bit, if that's a possibility. My speech afterwards, but I don't think you should be able to do that. I've seen looking at my stick with Laura and things, and I was thinking, how do you contact people with Walter, or how are you contacting people? I think that, that uh, we'll work on doing a set of films, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and trying... It could be a funding issue. It would certainly be a funding issue initially, but I'm sure that heritage um, would be. There obviously is a great need for this artist there is. to follow through. Isn't there? Yeah, mm. there is. Yeah, um, and I think that Jane will work on it. Yeah. I'm happy to be involved. Uh, okay, that's brilliant. Really good. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, Lorelai. Um, is there one project that stands out in your mind that? Has given you particular pleasure or pride? Uh, well, all of them, really, because uh, it's every every job I do, basically, right, is a is a it's something someone else's creation, and um, and I've had to and I've had to fix it for them, and uh, obviously, like you get some good ones and some bad ones, but um, you know, especially like uh, if you go to a job and you find that the measurements aren't right. And that's, that's a problem. Well, it's, it's not a problem for me because I have to fix it. You know, and, uh, and that's where another skill comes in. You know, actually knowing how to, having a fixer who can actually fix whatever could be wrong. Mm -hmm. It's no good sending someone to Barbados or, you know, to someone like that and to find that you've got the measurements wrong, like happened to me. You know, and, uh, and then <coughs> you've got to fix it. You know, and uh, you could you send someone over there otherwise. You know, to make a picture up again, but because I've made a picture up over the years, um, and I know that to make them, um, it's easy for me. Yeah. But, but as far as one project, well, there's, there's quite a few. I mean, uh, every project I do by Sin like is, is it gives me great pleasure. You know, uh, when I finish it, some of them a bit harder to do. It all depends on the weather again. Like you know, um, that's the main issue: the weather, especially if they're outside. If they're inside, they're not too much of an issue. Mm. Uh, but outside, it's the weather. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mosaic yourself? Sorry? Do you mosaic yourself? What, make them? No. What, I find, I find it boring. <laughs> <laughs> Time consuming. <laughs> and I 
<laughs> but I don't know how people make money out of it. <laughs> okay, last question. <laughs> Yes. Uh, when you say you work locally, would you come to Somerset? <laughs> come, come, sorry? When you say you don't, you don't work locally, would you be prepared to come to Somerset? Well, I've been, I've been all around the world for Tim's sake, so Somerset's not far. Okay. <laughs> okay, can we put our hands together for Walter?